Hello class, welcome to module 8. This week we're going to be looking at hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is one of the kind of two sides of the coin of inferential statistics we talked about last week. We were looking at confidence intervals and estimation last week. Well, hypothesis testing is how we are going to make decisions about a population based on data. So let's take a look. Here is the idea. We're trying to conclude something about the population. Is this true or is that true? And we really are going to look at only two competing hypotheses at a time. Uh, the whole way that <laughs> hypothesis testing is designed is really only to compare two hypotheses at a time. So we set up what's called a null hypothesis. And this is going to be what we assume true unless we can prove otherwise. So we maybe come into this with some sort of assumption, something we think is probably true, or at least we assume it, it's true, it's the best theory that we have so far, and then we put up next to it an alternative hypothesis. This is what we're gonna, what we're gonna look at. We're gonna see if the data that we collect support the alternative hypothesis. It doesn't mean that we're proving the alternative hypothesis true, if the, the data is collected and the data is really not in line with our null hypothesis, then we throw out the null hypothesis and then we adopt the alternative hypothesis. That's the idea. Um, so it's actually, uh, what we really are doing is, uh, I should say, not, we're not testing the alternative hypothesis really, we're testing the null hypothesis with respect to the alternative hypothesis. So the process uh, roughly is, we first state the null and alternative hypotheses, we collect some data, we calculate what's what we call a test statistic, some number based on the data that's going to be very useful in determining the truth of the null hypothesis. Depending on the test, a different test statistic is going to be calculated. So we need a test statistic. And then, based on the significance level of our test, we make the conclusion. We can do the conclusion in a couple of different ways, but this is basically it. Basically the, the process. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more detail in a little bit, but that's the idea. We make a conclusion based on this a significance level, take into account the test statistic, and, that, and, you, and you state your conclusion. First off, let's look at what kinds of tests we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to be, you can test many things about a population, but we're going to be looking at testing parameters of the population. We're going to be trying to say whether this or that is a more plausible value for a population parameter. Say the population mean or the population proportion. Let's look at the mean, for instance. A null hypothesis, we're going to be stating it as a so-called simple hypothesis, where the null hypothesis says that the mean is equal to some value. You're always going to have equality in your null hypothesis. It's either going to be equal to, if it's a simple null hypothesis, or equal to, or greater than, or equal to, or less than. I, For, for us, let's forget about greater than or equal to and less than or equal to. Let's just use equal to for the null hypothesis for this course. All right. The alternative hypothesis, uh, there's a couple different, there's three different notations that I've seen for this. H1, H capital A, and H lowercase a. Let's use H1. So we use H with a subscript zero for the null hypothesis, also called H naught. Naught is the N-A-U-G-H-T, the very old-fashioned word for nothing or zero, H0 versus H1. If your, your alternative hypothesis is the way that you encode a claim or a hunch that you may have or a hunch or a claim that somebody else is making, and if the claim is that the mean is less than 15, your, null hypo your alternative hypothesis is going to be mu is less than 15. That's called a left-tailed test. Uh, you could have a right-tailed test or a two-tailed test, and they're going to look something like that. Okay, 
left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed. So I guess you could think of it as there's three kinds of tests that we would look at. Left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed. So a two-tailed test is, is where the, the alternative is purely complementary. Like we don't have any sort of hunch that the mean is greater than or less than 15. We just think it's different than 15. All right, let's take a look at an example. The average wait time at DMVs across the country is 70 minutes. Let's just suppose that's true. A new system is put in place at the local DMV where they're trying to speed things up. A random sample of wait times is observed and we want to determine from this sample, can we conclude that the average wait time, like the true average wait time at this DMV, has it decreased? So in this case, we're supposing that the mean, the null hypothesis is that really nothing has changed. So the mean is still equal to 70. Because we're testing the claim or the hunch that the wait time is decreased, the alternative is going to be that mu is less than 70. So, okay, now to get into the nitty gritty, you could think, okay, well, what if you have a sample, sample average of 15 minutes? All right, that's, that's pretty strong evidence probably, right? Uh, how could the true average wait time be 70 and yet you get a sample mean of 15? That's very unlikely, but okay. But what if you get a sample average of 68 minutes instead of 70? Well, that's smaller than 70, but is that small enough for us to conclude that the true average has decreased? Or could we have just happened to have a lucky sample? Well, significance is uh, the, the idea of assigning this difference to a real, a real true difference rather than just sampling error. The, the, the sample mean could be less than 70 due to just the randomness of sampling, right? Or it could be due to a true, uh, a true difference in mean, like the mean could really be less than 70. And that's why we got a small sample mean. So we would say that that's a significant result if we can assign that to a real difference and not to just sampling error. But then how small does the sample mean have to be for us to make that conclusion? So it really depends on how sure we need to be because we can never be 100% sure. And we want to put some sort of limit on you know, the likelihood that we make the wrong choice. So let's, and, and it really depends on the sample size also and the standard error, like how much variability there is in the sample. So let's get into that. Um, actually, we'll get into that in a little bit. So I want to talk about conclusions. So, so we'll talk about how you calculate whether or not your, 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 um, your data is significant or not. Um, but let's, if it is, if you do have significant evidence, strong evidence in favor of the alternative, you would say something like this. We reject the null hypothesis and conclude there is sufficient evidence or strong evidence or significant evidence in support of the alternative hypothesis. And if, if not, you would say something like, we do not reject the null hypothesis. There is not sufficient evidence. There is insufficient evidence in support of the alternative hypothesis. Or you could say that there's not significant evidence. We never say we, we accept the, the null hypothesis because we've already accepted it. It's accepted to be true already. So that's not a change. The only, if you've already accepted something and then you're testing it, you either reject it or you don't reject it. It's already accepted. So we don't say we accept the null hypothesis. We would, and we don't say we accept um, or we have proven the alternative hypothesis. We really are talking about the null hypothesis. That's what we are testing directly, okay? So this is the kind of language you wanna be using. Um, and, and the kind of mistakes that we can make are summarized in this table. All right, think about it like this. In reality, the null hypothesis is either true or it is not true, right? The mean is, the mean is evil either 70 or it isn't 70. That's reality. Now, if 
the mean, if the, if the null hypothesis is true, uh, what, what would be the best decision to make from our test? It would be to not reject the null hypothesis, right? So look at the decision that we can make now. You either are going to reject the null hypothesis or not. If the null hypothesis is true and you reject it, that's, that's a mistake. Now, it doesn't mean that you, as the statistician, made a mistake in your calculations or in your procedure. Uh, it just means that due to sampling and due to the randomness of collecting data, sometimes uh, the, these procedures lead to making a type 1 error. That happens sometimes. Uh, alternatively, maybe the null hypothesis is not true. The mean isn't 70. And yet, our sample data is so close to 70, right, that we end up not rejecting the null hypothesis. That's called a type 2 error, where we're failing to detect a significant difference. Uh, that's also bad. Um, and, and of course, if we, the other, the other possibilities are making the right choice. So, we want to limit these errors somehow. And statisticians have decided that what we what we do is we say okay if the null hypothesis is true we want to limit the probability that we make a type 1 error and what we're going to do is we're going to set a limit on that like 5% or 1% and we're going to make rejecting uh re rejecting either more require more evidence or less evidence depending on how sure we need to be All right that's the idea so let's look at that in a little bit more, more detail. So what we do with our test statistic and significance level. So the test statistic is typically, um, it's going to be based on, in, for the sample mean, it's based on the sample mean. Um, we'll be using what's called a t-statistic because it's going to be related to the t-distribution. And the significance level, as I said, Often it's it's alpha is the Greek letter we use to notate it, and it's it's often point zero uh, five. That's kind of the 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 default. People sometimes make it smaller. But remember, if if you want to be really really sure, you're not going to reject the null hypothesis when it's true. You make your, your significance level smaller. Okay, because that is the probability that you reject the null hypothesis when it is true. That's the probability of making a type 1 error. That's what significance level is. So, okay, based, so what we do is we say, okay, if the null hypothesis were true, then we have a sampling distribution for our test statistic. And that's based on the central limit theorem. Uh, the classical approach says, okay, based on the significance level, we either have some little region in one tail or in two tails that we call a rejection region. And we say if the test statistic is so uh, far out in the tail that it's in the rejection region, then we reject the null hypothesis. That's the classical approach. So we find this critical value, and it's based on the significance level, and then we either reject or we don't reject the null hypothesis. Uh, the p-value approach is a little different. So we take our test statistic, and what we do is we, we find the sampling distribution of the test statistic, and we figure out how extreme is this test statistic. If the null hypothesis are, is true, what is the likelihood that we were to uh, do a sample and result in a test statistic like we have or even more extreme than we have? We call this the p-value. You could think of it as a plausibility value. It's kind of like saying, based on, well, here's what it is technically. If the null hypothesis were true, how likely is it, what's the probability that we would see data like we have? And you can see if that is very small, that means that our data really doesn't jive with the null hypothesis. And if that doesn't jive, then we would say, okay, the null hypothesis probably isn't true. Uh, you can think of it very simply, though technically incorrectly, but simply as a plausibility measure of our null hypothesis. How plausible is the null hypothesis in light of our data? That's what the p-value is. 
Um, anyway, the p-value approach, basically we, we get our test statistic and calculate a p-value, and we compare that to the significance level. If the p-value is smaller than the significance level, we consider that significant, and we reject the null hypothesis. That's what the p-value approach is. So it's, you always are going to make the same conclusion that you did in, as the classical approach. You're never going to have contradictory conclusions based if you use the classical or the p-value approach. The benefit of the p-value approach is, in addition to having a conclusion, you also associate a significance uh, a, a value, like a p-value, with your results. So, for example, you might have a p-value of 0.49999, which is like just under your 5% that you're using as a significance level, and you would reject. Or you might have a p-value of 0 0.00000001, and in that case, you're really, really, really sure that the null hypothesis is, is incorrect in the latter case, and you're pretty sure that it's not correct in the first case, right? But the p-value tells you more information. It tells you something about how sure you are in your conclusion. All right, so what is our test statistic? Uh, it's going to be either a Z statistic or a T statistic. It'll either follow a normal distribution or a T distribution. So if the population is normally distributed, if we know that the population follows a normal distribution, and we know the population's standard deviation, in other words, never, the test statistic will be a Z statistic. Uh, it's found by this formula, and it will follow a standard normal distribution. But like I said, we never know the population standard deviation, really. And so we, in practice, we're going to use a t-statistic for hypothesis testing. So it's going to be the s same uh, formula, pretty much, except we're going to use the sample standard deviation in the formula. Uh, and that's going to follow a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So that's the test statistic that we're going to use. We know it's sampling distribution, it's a t-distribution, so we can find critical values and we can find p-values based on that. In practice, you actually can use technology. Uh, I'm going to show you in the next video how to use stat powers to do hypothesis testing and to get the test statistic and the p-value. So if you're going to use a critical, critical, the classical approach, critical values are found as a percentile. So let's take, for example, uh, the example of doing a, a test with a sample size of 45 and we've got a significance level of 0 0.05. So what is a critical value going to be in this case? If we're doing a left-tailed test, we want to find a critical T value such that it's going to have 5% in the left tail. And that turns out to be negative 1.6802. You can find that using any T distribution calculator. A right-tailed test is going to be found by finding what is the value that traps 5% in the right tail. And it turns out that's 1.6802. It's the just the positive of uh, the other the previous one. For a two-tailed test, you take your 5% and you split it in half. Half of it goes in each of the lower and the upper tail. And so a crit the for the two-tailed test, we're going to reject the null hypothesis if either our test statistic is greater than 2.0154 or if it's less than 2.0154. So, or in other words, if the absolute value of it is greater than 2.0154. So that's what, that's what a critical region is going to look like f if you're using the, the, uh, the, the classical approach. All right. That's all I'm going to say for hypothesis testing in this video. We're going to see in the next one how to use some software to, to do a hypothesis test or do a couple of them. All right.